हफ्ते राष्ट्रीय पांडुलिपि मिशन के तत्वबोध व्याख्यान माला के अंतर्गत आयोजित आज के इस सत्र में मैं आप सभी विद्वर्जनों का पांडुलिपि अनुरागियों का और मिशन के शुभ चिंतकों का स्वागत करता हूँ आज का विषय है भारतीय अभिलेखों में दस्तावेज मुहर हस्ताक्षर एवं उत्कीर्णक और वक्ता हैं डॉक्टर रविशंकर श्रीनिवासन पूर्व निदेशक मैसूर पूर्व निदेशक रहे हैं ए एस आई मैसूर के आज की अध्यक्षता करेंगे प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर सचिदानंद जोशी जो इंदिरा गांधी राष्ट्रीय कला केंद्र के सदस्य सचिव हैं और कुछ समय बाद हम हमारे साथ जुड़ेंगे जैसा कि आप जानते हैं मिशन की स्थापना पर्यटन और संस्कृति मंत्रालय भारत सरकार के द्वारा फरवरी 2003 में पांडुलिपियों में पांडुलिपियों के संरक्षण और भारत की विशाल पांडुलिपि संपदा में सन्निहित ज्ञान को अनावृत करने के उद्देश्य से की गई भारत में पांडुलिपियों का एक लंबा इतिहास है देश की मौखिक परंपराओं को कम्प्लीमेंट करती ये पांडुलिपियां दर्शन धर्मशास्त्र कला साहित्य विज्ञान के रूप में विविध ज्ञान को समेटे हुए है अनुभव विचार और व्यवहार में भारत की बहुलतावाद में विभिन्न पांडुलिपि व्याख्यानों को फलने और फूलने का आधार प्रदान किया भारत के पास एक करोड़ से अधिक पांडुलिपियों के होने का अनुमान है जो शायद दुनिया का सबसे बड़ा संग्रह है विभिन्न भाषा लिपि एवं विषयों में होने के कारण अभी तक हम कुछ ही पांडुलिपियों तक पहुंचे हैं इसके लिए जन जागरण की जरूरत है जीवन यापन से संबंधित ऐसा शायद ही कोई विषय हो जो हमारे पांडुलिपियों में नहीं है और इसी उद्देश्य से मिशन ने 2005 में तत्वबोध व्याख्यान माला का आयोजन शुरू किया तत्वबोध का अर्थ है ज्ञान के आधारभूत तत्व को समझना अभी तक हुए व्याख्यानों को तत्वबोध प्रकाशन श्रृंखला के अंतर्गत आठ वॉल्यूम में प्रकाशित किया जा चुका है और वह मिशन के वेबसाइट पर पढ़ने के लिए उपलब्ध है कोविड 19 महामारी के कारण हमने मई 2020 में तत्वबोध का ऑनलाइन सीरीज शुरू की देश के मूर्धन विद्वानों को हम इस कार्यक्रम के माध्यम से जोड़ने का प्रयास करते हैं आपका सहयोग इसमें वांछनीय है आज के वक्ता हैं डॉक्टर टी एस रविशंकर डॉक्टर टी एस रविशंकर ने एम ए संस्कृत एम एंशियंट हिस्ट्री एंड आर्कियोलॉजी और पीएचडी मैसूर विश्वविद्यालय से की भारतीय पुरातत्व तो सर्वेक्षण की पुरालेख पुरालेख शाखा में एक पुरालेख सहायक के रूप में शामिल होने के बाद उन्होंने विभिन्न पदों पर 35 वर्षों से अधिक सेवा की और धीरे धीरे शाखा प्रमुख के वर्तमान पद निदेशक के पद तक पहुंचे हैं वह एपिग्राफिकल सोसाइटी ऑफ इंडिया के कार्यकारी सदस्य हैं प्लेस नेम्स सोसाइटी ऑफ इंडिया के अध्यक्ष हैं साउथ इंडियन न्यूमिस्मेटिक सोसाइटी के उपाध्यक्ष हैं डॉक्टर टी एस रविशंकर ने संस्कृत शिला लेखों और पुरानी सिक्कों को समझने में अपनी विशेषज्ञता स्थापित की है उन्होंने विभागीय प्रकाशनों भारतीय पुरालेख पर कई वार्षिक रिपोर्टों का संपादन किया है उन्होंने सिक्कों की सिक्कों की जाँच के लिए दिल्ली सीमा शुल्क कार्यालय में भारतीय पुरातत्व तो सर्वेक्षण के विशेषज्ञ न्यूमिस्मेटिस्ट के रूप में काम किया है पिछले तीस वर्षों से अधिक समय से वह भारतीय पुरातत्व तो सर्वेक्षण नई दिल्ली के पुरातत्व तो संस्थान में पुरातत्व तो में पुरातत्व तो में स्नातकोत्तर डिप्लोमा के छात्रों को पढ़ा रहे हैं उन्होंने दिल्ली और मैसूर में पुरालेख और मुद्रा शास्त्र पर कई कार्यशालाओं का समन्वय और संचालन किया है उन्होंने विभिन्न स्थानों पर कई महत्वपूर्ण पुरातात्विक खनन में भी भाग लिया है जिसमें महत्वपूर्ण अयोध्या है राष्ट्रीय और अंतर्राष्ट्रीय स्तर के कई कई स्तर के कई संगोष्ठियों सम्मेलनों में भी भाग लिया है और कई प्रतिष्ठित पत्रिकाओं में अंग्रेजी और कन्नड़ भाषाओं में कई विद्वानों के लेखों का योगदान दिया है उन्होंने सरकार के सांस्कृतिक आदान प्रदान कार्यक्रम के तहत उस देश अजरबैजान देश की उपलब्ध नागरी शिलालेखों के अध्ययन के लिए बाकू का भी दौरा किया है हाल ही में उन्होंने इंदिरा गांधी राष्ट्रीय मुक्त विश्वविद्यालय और आईआईटी आई खड़गपुर में एपिग्राफी पर व्याख्यान दिया धारवार में आयोजित 2016 में भारतीय एपिग्राफिकल सोसाइटी के वे जनरल प्रेसिडेंट रहे कर्नाटक राज्य मुक्त विश्वविद्यालय के लिए एम प्राचीन इतिहास और पुरातत्व के लिए एपिग्राफी के लिए उन्होंने पाठ्यक्रम तैयार किया आई नई दिल्ली में दो में लेख पर कार्यक्रम आयोजित किया आपने इस 
डिफिकल्ट सब्जेक्ट के ऊपर में अपनी 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 अनुभवों को रखने के लिए जो हमारी पहल को स्वीकार किया मिशन उसके लिए आपका स्वागत करता है आज के अध्यक्ष डॉक्टर सचितानंद जोशी हैं एक कुशल प्रकाश प्रशासक के साथ साथ आप शिक्षाविद कलाविद साहित्यकार इतिहासकार लेखक और कवि हैं आपकी कई कहानी संग्रह और आपकी कविता संग्रह प्रकाशित हो चुकी है कुछ समय पूर्व ही आपके कृति पुत्र का मेष्ट का विमोचन हुआ है आपके संरक्षण में मिशन का कार्यकलाप अग्रसर हो रहा है आपने इस कार्यक्रम की अध्यक्षता स्वीकार की के लिए आपका आभारी है और आपका स्वागत करता है अब मैं रविशंकर जी से रिक्वेस्ट करूंगा कि वो अपना लेक्चर शुरू करें एम एस बीच में ज्वाइन करेंगे ऐसा उनका आदेश है गुड इवनिंग टू ऑल दूअर्स आई एम हाईली थैंकफुल टू बोथ दर्गेनाइजेशन आई जी एन सी ए एंड नेशनल मिशन फॉर मैनस्क्रिप्ट फॉर हैविंग गिवन मी दिस अपॉर्चुनिटी टू डिलीवर टाक फॉर दत्वोध सीरीज I am highly beholden to our chairperson, Honorable Dr. Sachidan Joshi Ji, Member Secretary, IGNC New Delhi, for chairing this talk, and it's my proud privilege to have deep regards for him for keen interest he has shown in promoting epigraphical and calligraphical studies. I am thankful to Professor Pratap Anand Jha. director national mission for manuscripts and many officials of uh, both the uh, organization uh, for considering me for this talk as uh, today i'm going to talk about the document seal signature scribes in indian epigraphs on many other occasions i have spoken on different aspects on epigraphical studies and calligraphical studies mm-hmm. i thought let me touch upon the practical aspect the physical aspect how the document can be upon and as you know uh, i did not reiterate here our subcontinent is very very rich in epigraphical wealth equally so of manuscripts and uh, broadly speaking the inscriptions fall under two categories one the lithic or stone inscriptions and the other the copper plate and there are writings on other materials too i did not emphasize and uh, today mostly the the my talk you know hinges around the copper plate charters which were earlier the document literally they were considered document even inscription too more so of uh, uh, copper plate uh, inscriptions see i did not to go into the the format of the an inscription which will take much more time and invariably both in uh, stone inscription more so of prashasti and the copper plate charters invariably you find at the end of the record you find the mention of three important persons naturally before or after the invocatory verses we get the name of the composer of the inscription and the writer and lastly the engraver so these three personalities or persons who are involved in bringing out in making copper plate charts are extremely essential and today we are going into the different uh, aspects mentioned in different inscriptions about them and uh, basically more so when did the writing tradition started that's very very important whether let it be manuscriptology 
our inscription uh, unfortunately we don't have a decisive reply for this or mention in the records but i would like to share some of the thoughts ideas or uh, opinions shared by different scholars uh, epigraphical studies and manuscriptology cannot be seen in isolation since script and language form the basis or foundation for both disciplines understanding and appreciation of certain basic concepts basic concepts and fundamental and fundamental elements connected with both the studies are highly essential i need not reiterate here every subject is gaining multidisciplinary and multi dimensional approach for better understanding when we look at the genesis of writing is very important to all you know a scholar in manuscriptology as well as an epigraphist or some historian scholar need to look into it and understand where does or where are the references and we have many literary sources also which i would like to deal in little more extent because we are connected more with the manuscripts also so when we look at the genesis of writing attempts were first made to write on perishable material i am just uh, putting in brief uh, perishable material like bark birch leaves or palm leaves so this we had uh, much much earlier even the epigraphs came into existence so writing on perishable material was a very old tradition it's known to all and definitely it was used as a draft before they brought it or engraved on a copper plate or stone they did draft it for all the final approval as we submit submit the draft getting the approval then they will transfer it put it on the copper plate so the same tradition you see there were so many officials connected with it so many terms connected with that so many officials that we would like to deal a document how it used to be before they were transferred on the lithic copper plate charter subsequently validated validation is very important so the history of writing in india is essentially coextensive with the history of brahmi script and its many derivatives and the kharosthi script these are the two major scripts that stands out and brahmi and its derivatives has a very long history i should say of down a 500 years whether it is a script to be seen on the manuscripts in a much much later phase or on the inscription brahmi inscription uh, uh, which i am not going at detail because uh, our talk uh, hinges around a certain aspects of it it is uh, when you look into the some of the literatures it is oral tradition rather than learning rather than written learning that has always been esteemed in india as true knowledge they uh, held this view to substantiate this beautiful adage pustaka sthatu ya vidya parahastam gatam dhanam this is what said knowledge in a book is like a money in someone's hand in the same breath we can cite words from kalidasa rugomsha nipereyatha vad grahanena vangmayam nadi mukhene eva samudram avish as one enters the ocean through the mouth of a river so did raghu enter into literature by learning to write correctly this the what we get from uh, kalidasa's bhuvamsha uh, there is paucity of description of writing in sanskrit and li related literatures regarding the origin and history of writing its varieties styles and methods and practical 
instruction therein are surprisingly rare in Indian texts. Of course, there are few incidental references in some relatively late texts to the invention of writing by the creator, God Brahma. In Narada Smriti, there is a reference, Nakarshit Yadi Shrasta Likitam Chakshuruttamam Tatreyam Asya Lokasya Na Bhavishyat Shubham Gatihi. That is what said. Had the creator, Brahma, not invented writing, the supreme I, the course of this world, would not have gone well. Similarly, while Devi Diranja, when he wrote the book on the alphabets, he has expressed about emphasizing the art of writing. He says, more than the discovery of the fire, the wheel, the art of writing is the greatest a creation of the mankind. Just think how things would have paralyzed in the absence of writing what would have been our uh, present state. Another statement from Vyavahara Prakash of uh, Mitram Mishra's deserves our attention. Shanmasi Kepi Same Dhantihi Sabagyayate Nanam Bhatrakshurani Sishtani Patra Rudha Kani Atah Pura. Because men forget things within six months of old, the creator invented letters to be set down on leaves to be noted. This is very, very important. This tradition is also reflected iconographically. Normally, when you see an image of Brahma or Saraswati, she is invariably seen holding palm leaves. So the tradition, the creator, the goddess of learning, and the God, the creator, it's all there. There are uh, some more uh, iconographical uh, representation, which I would like to uh, show at the end of my talk with some more uh, copper plates and all. Being regularly depicted in sculpture with a book in hand, but beyond legend accounts, the literature of Brahminical Hindu tradition on the whole, little to say about writing as such. When compared to Brahminical tradition, the heterodox traditions of Buddhism and Jainism has a different perspective to offer as writing is concerned and they showed great esteem for written, written word. That's how we notice the art of calligraphy. The art of calligraphy is more highly developed in Buddhist and Jaina uh, manuscript tradition than in the Brahminical tradition. Among the Buddhist work, which is often quoted by the epigraphists or the calligraphists, uh, is Lalita Vistara, which furnishes a list of 64 scripts in the 10th chapter beginning with Brahmi and Karoshti. Similar, but much brief list of 18 scripts. 18 scripts are also preserved in Jaina canonical uh, Buddhist, uh, Jaina canonical Prakrit texts. The oldest form of list which appears is the Pandavana Sutta and the Samoyanga Sutta. These are the two works and uh, it also mentions 18 uh, script, uh, Brahmi and its derivatives. Uh, Brahmi written in different forms. That's what is uh, written in the practice portion. So many historians and epigraphists have addressed the question of possibility of literary in pre-Mauryan India through the examination of literary and other evidence. The testimony of Greek and Latin, all authors on writing, early in India has been studied by many scholars, but remains somewhat inconclusive. For instance, near Kaus, who visited the Northwestern India around 325 BC, explicitly mentioned that Indians wrote letters on uh, cotton cloth, maybe with the reference to writing in Aramaic. Megasthenes, who lived in the Northeastern India some decades after near Kaus, states that 
Indians did not know written characters. So in which context you mentioned, we don't know exactly. The Pali Buddhist canon, especially the Jatakas and the Vinaya Pitaka contains numerous explicit documents. In Panini's Ashtadhyayi, we seem to have a clear reference to early writing, the term Lipi or Libi script. Panini's date is a matter of complex uh, controversy. As to archaeological and epigraphical evidence for the antiquity of writing in the historical period, we have only a small handful of brief archaic inscriptions. We may say in conclusion, both the literary and epigraphic evidence for the antiquity of historical writing in India are disappointingly inconclusive uh, since virtually all the testimony in, is in one way or another vague or ambiguous. Writing and engraving. Uh, in ancient India, the practice writing, the letters on a record with ink, with ink, uh, softer material and the scratching or engraving them on a hard uh, substance were popular. It's quite popularly known that before engraving, usually on copper plate, which I just uh, told in the beginning, and occasionally on stones, the royal charters were generally written at first on a perishable material. There were a set of people or community, especially among the Brahmanas, especially among the Brahmanas who had mastered the sacred lore in ancient and medieval India. Accession to secular learning of the three R's was available to the upper classes of non-Brahminical community. Please note this, non-Brahminical uh, communities. Literate people of these classes often took the writer's profession. And as a result, the communities of professional writers gradually came into being even in the early period. They, were, they formed a class uh, by themselves. The most popular and uh, uh, common expression for the writer of a document or the copies of a manuscript is, was lekhaka. Lekhaka, what we get, which also signified a professional clerk. It may be noted that the word lipikara occurs in the edicts of Ashoka and subsequently it became a designation occurring in some early inscriptions as Raja Lipikara. Raja Lipikara, often member of the Brahmana community, adopted this provision and there were many copies. They formed a class uh, set by themselves. If Brahmanas did the copying work, both the secular and also religious, the Buddhists and Jain monks are known to have copied works of their religious works, religious literature. The terms Kayastha, Karanika, or Karanin stands for an officer belonging to Karana. Karana, it's very known, the office of administration. Vigneshwara explains the word occurring in Yajnavalkya Spruti as Ganaka, Lekhanascha, an accountant scribe. The Kayastas first occur in inscription of Gupta age. Medieval lexicons, Vajayanti, recognize Kayastha and Karana as synonymous terms meaning a scribe or a member of the writer class. We may take note of the Persian word Dabir or Divira, writer. It stands for probably the expression found entry through parts of Western India which was under the influence of Shakas and the Sasanians of Iran. The text to be engraved on stone, especially private records like prepared by professional writers and a copy it was given to the engraver who was generally a mason. Please note, Sutradhara, mason uh, called the Sutradhara Shilakuta, a person who works on this one and the Rupakara. A sculptor also sometimes did the job and they also did this. The mason at first pressed the stone and drew the letters on it with ink, ink, etc. 
under supervision and guidance of the writer. He did under the guidance of a writer. Please note and then engrave the letters carefully. The professional writer himself sometimes copied the text of the document. This also is seen uh, on the stone for the guidance of engraver. There are some records, the letters of which are painted on stone. I will show you later. Uh, but remains in, incomplete and unfinished. I don't know, they discontinued. We have a, such a, a, a copper plate charter where uh, they, they have painted it. Only they could engrave the first line. All the remaining lines are just left. And that's a very classic example. I will show that uh, later. And the slovenliness or carelessness is seen in large number of inscriptions. It's not that every record is done by a skilled person. I've seen many records, Yatra Safala, when they go to different places, they just want to record their visit to that particular uh, famous place. So just they perhaps engage a local person to engrave it. So here you find, uh, as Dr. Ramesh puts it, uh, the strains, you know, the rustic strains he called, not the, the way it is written. Even I will show some record of Paramara period where we have very clearly, beautifully incised inscription and of the similar period where it is very irregular or not that uh, skillfully recorded uh, inscription. On the other hand, for royal records, a learned man of the court was engaged to prepare fair copy of the text on a sheet of birch bark or to write it on stone slabs, copper plates with ink or a pointed instrument. The text of a copper plate grant was generally prepared by a high officer of the king and the eulogistic portion. Normally you see any record, you see the prashasti portion were given for a pandit hours in the court to be composed and the remaining the operative portion perhaps uh, did by the other uh, person who is in the uh, service of the court. Uh, officer, eulogistic. The composition appearing in medieval records were composed by the court poets. Writing the text of a document on the plates first in ink is clearly seen in a copper plate discarded at Kassia. It's a Kassia, Gorakhpur district, Uttar Pradesh, which bears 13 lines of writing of which only the first is incised, while the remaining 12 lines are written in black ink. And fortunately, it has remained. Fortunately, I should say it is still exist in the, what sort of indelible ink they use. We don't know, but it is there. And to facilitate the work of engraving and also to ensure correctness of the inscription, it has come to our notice that some early copper plate charters are formed by means of dots. Uh, Taxila inscription of Patika, you see that there are some uh, strokes are formed, but in particular inscription, we find the letters are formed with dots, with the dots. Uh, and uh, in South India also, there are a couple of inscriptions uh, where, you know, it just appears like a manuscript with a very thin and you know, a stylus. Uh, they just uh, engraved without making it uh, a deeper, not a deeper engraving. Just when you hold, you know, a thin sheet, it just appears like a manuscript. There are such inscriptions. One of the Malayalam inscription is there. Though it will of course little late period, but when you compare uh, at least the earlier inscriptions, the curly copper plate charters of the Western Gangas or the uh, um, Kadambas, and even if you go a little earlier, the Pallava charters, they just appear like a chart. Uh, manuscript. Interestingly, Kalhanas Raja Tarangini uh, narrates about the officer in charge of the preparation of documents at the Kashmirian court, Ottapadadhyaya, that is a professional teacher in charge of preparation of title deeds. Please note, title deeds belonging to Akshapatala, this is a department, and this uh, term occurs in various uh, copper plate charters. I think it's a very huge uh, department 
where they had to preserve all the uh, uh, the deeds, you know, the charts. Uh, they restored, they preserved the records. For a similar expression, there are different terms in occurring in inscriptions. Uh, Dharma Lekin is also correct. Dharma Lekin, Shasanika, Shasanadhikarika. So the different officials, very interesting uh, to note uh, such terms occurring in inscription. Shasanod Adhikarin. As known through epigraphs, it's uh, often illiterate or semi-literate stone cutters or goldsmiths were entrusted with the task of engraving records on stone or copper plate. Uh, this accounts for the numerous errors, numerous errors in a large number of epigraphs, especially those engraved on behalf of private uh, individuals. Please note, it is from public, private individuals. It has been brought to our notice how according to Mitakshara on the Yajnavalki Spruti, a royal deed had to be written in correct and elegant language. It uh, clearly specifies. The Benares plate of Kalachuri Karna offers an instance of an imperial charter written and engraved by irresponsible and incompetent persons. It is observed that some minor errors noticed in the record of imperial ruling families are generally due to the scribes scribes and not to the engravers. It is the scribal era. Medieval records mention names of person responsible for engraving a copper plate grant Utkirna. These are the terms you get. Ut, utkil, utkilita. Uh, mostly these engravers were styled as uh, Pitala, Pitalahara, Lohakara, Ayaskara and uh, Sutradhara, Mason. Uh, Hemakara, even we have where the goldsmith also worked on this, and uh, Sunara, we get a uh, goldsmith. Uh, further, we have terms like Shilpin, Vijnanin, Agmijnanika. These are the names of the artisans uh, we get in the uh, record. The eagerness, the engraver is mentioned as. Akkasalin, this is a quite the term, uh, very popular in South also. Akkasalika, uh, Arkasalin, Akkasale, these are the uh, various expressions that do occur uh, in inscribed inscriptions from Ganjam and uh, uh, Sri Kakulam region. Uh, some of the manuals meant for guidance for the clerks, for the preparation documents are also mentioned. It's quite uh, very, very interesting. Uh, Kshemendra of uh, uh, Vyasa Dasa, uh, Loka Prakasha, Leka Panchashika, Leka Padhati. See, these are the codified, the words, you know, they follow. It's not just uh, as they do it. There are, these are the words uh, mentioned in Patra Kaundi ascribed to Vararuchi, this uh, important work. Another very important aspect or segment connected with the document is omission in the Corrections, which we also do happen in our writing and the pagination. In both manuscripts and inscription, a letter omitted by scribe, though above or by sight, was generally written above or below, which we do that. Uh, and in case of copper plates, such passages were generally read off by chiseling or beating, by hammering and the correction re-engraved uh, on the erasure. So there are instances where entire writing of an inscription on copper plates was beaten in hammering and a totally record was re-engraved and these are called the uh, polymcests. I will show this example where they reused uh, earlier charter, they erased and there are many such instances that are called polymcests reusing the same copper plate where we can see the earlier Chalukyan record also and the late Vijayanagar ruler also, the half uh, done. So this is called a palimpsest. There are such uh, records. Numbering of the pages also is met with in both the manuscripts and uh, copper plate charters where there are more number of sheets. 
Now, uh, preservation of copper plate glands. Uh, see, copper plate glands were very valuable documents. It's uh, very valuable for the Tonys as well as for their descendants. It should long last. Since the, their loss or destruction rendered the revenue free holdings created by them ordinary rent paying lands unless fresh charters were issued in the place of old ones. The Tonys therefore preserved the document only with special care. It may be noted that the originals of the records, grants from which the plates were prepared, probably written on perishable material, please, material must have been preserved in the records office. Akpatal, I earlier just referred, that's the office where they maintain the records. Now we go to the registrar, uh, some office like that, where they uh, maintain all the records. Very often mentioned in inscription, uh, regarded by as accountant, by others or record keeper. They were called the record keeper. The storeroom of the original grants is called Akshapatala, the storeroom where they maintain these records. And the department is probably called Halakara, Halakavara, that is Halakavara is the department, the storehouse of plates. Other officers connected with the maintenance record are Pustapala, Pusta, we don't know Pustapala, Pustakapala, Petapala, and uh, such names uh, do occur. Epigraphical reference uh, with regard to the writing materials, this is a very important aspect. Uh, Ashokan and post-modern period. Uh, Ashokan and post-modern period inscriptions are silent about the uh, writing materials, but the inscriptions of the Gupta and the post-Gupta periods have some direct and indirect references. Thus, the Kurd plates of uh, uh, Sharbapuriya king Narendra, uh, 500 to 525 Kamanara, states that the grand record in these plates was originally made by charter recorded on palm leaves. Please note, uh, palm leaves. Talapatra shasanena so ponyabhivirdhaye dattaka. That is grand. Uh, it is further stated that the palm leaf charter was burnt, was burnt uh, in a fire accident, and that it was endorsed by the king himself, uh, issuing a copper plate charter. Similarly, the Taleshwara copper plate inscription of Diti Varman, there is a reference to the land grants made by the ancestors of the king by means of charters written on cloth sheets. Here it is on cloth sheets pata, which were burned by again fire. It's a matter of great interest to note that books are actually in one of the charters of uh, the Maitrika King Guhasena, year 20, 240. It registers the gift of a village for the maintenance of resident marks. Uh, Duddha Mahavihara stated the acquisition of books on the holy faith. Sadharmasya Pustako Patra, that is accessing or purchasing of the uh, books as one of the purpose of the grant. The Kailwan copper plate inscription of, uh, uh, of the 7th century Manera, there is a reference to the writing of the Buddhist religion, Dharmasya Lekhana Vachanartham. It becomes quite evident that the palm leaves and cloth sheets were used for writing books and documents. While analyzing the education system that prevailed in the past through epigraphs, there is explicit mention of various subjects that were taught, both religious and secular. The mention of Adhyayana and Adhyapana. Among the Shatkarmas, you know, the Shatkarma Nirutas, we have uh, probably the use of writing materials. Uh, there were There is no specific uh, reference in the epigraphs except ones which were mentioned above. So, uh, though oral tradition was very strong, uh, since the large number of texts, I mean, uh, subjects were taught, I think that they did exist, the writing part, which they uh, kept in uh, place and perhaps handed over. We cannot totally preclude that the possibility of uh, writing, uh, it did exist, 
what does it mean adhyayana and adhyapana one has to read and one has to teach also so that is the process let's uh, turn our attention to some of the terms with the south indian uh, this is very important aspect from tamil nadu with regard to the writing material in epigraphs the word ovali please you know in tamil is significant as it specifically means the palm leaf ovali all chola great inscriptions ovali uh, palm leaf were used for writing it is interesting you note know, that the astrologer who carried calendar uh, is referred to as nalolai in inscriptions further interesting a document is styled as arai ovali half draft that is draft arai ovali and the officer who noted the uh, oral orders of the sovereign were called mandira ovali mandira ovali and uh, ovali nayagan that is also another term we get ovali nayagan all based on the palm leaves used for writing in fact there is an interesting statement in a inscription how actually the king graciously ordered that his instructions may be entered into accounts and the order that was written by the mandira ovali was issued with the signatures of the ovali nayagan the process of writing itself is deserved very it that is sequencing in lines the process of transferring the royal command first copied on palm leaf to more permanent material like stone is practically described in an inscription of tiruvalangadu where interesting instance is known through the inscription of rajendra chola state that while the king was dining in his day residence at shivapuri one of his officials informed him that 25 families may be settled on the land in the village to be rajendra chola padi to supply oil to the gt of tiruvalangadu granted the wish and the order was received with the signature of the royal secretary uh, tirumandira ovali and conveyed to the magistrate uh, who ordered it to be engraved on stone see it is not the, the king who makes the subjects in his court and why even while dining uh, when he was in his uh, he could uh, uh, take note of this situation and gave necessary instructions and the seal is uh, very very important uh, which i will be showing it need not be reiterated here to proclaim the validity validity of the copper plate a document affixing a seal is very important and uh, considered dharma shastra uh, upholds the same it has been brought to our uh, notice the beautiful statement mentioned mudra rakshasa how the minister of the nandas wonder uh, he can deny the validity of a document bearing his own seal although he was not uh, uh, responsible for its issue lekhoyam na mameti nottaram idam mudra madiya eta that is what mudra rakshasa says a couple of allusions we can draw from literary sources to regarding uh, represent uh, supreme importance of the seal and the ramayana we have got that uh, instance do it is there so various types of uh, seals found throughout the length in the country uh, not only but they also found the primary source like epigraphs there are private seals seals of guilds seals of high officials and dignitaries and local people as mentioned about the purpose of the seal is to validate the authority of the person whom sever has issue the seals and sealings which are found in uh, enormous number normally in course of excavation uh, which forms a separate study by itself as primary source another one is seal attached to the copper plate ring that i am speaking here when we examine and analyze fully the intact uh, copper plate charters with the ring and seal which i will be showing Uh, we come across motives attached to this like lanchan just by seeing the seal you can just uh, ascribe uh, uh, to which dynasty the copper plate belongs to each dynasty and even minor ruling families too can be read. in some charter belonging to the medieval and late uh, uh, medieval period 
we find motives engraved on this some like vakataka charter we find inscription engraved on the seal uh, without any motive for example bull is on the popular lanchanas the bull is found on the seals of uh, maitrika bataraka and on the sonapat seal of harshavardhana the varaha so the lanchana for a number of dynasties like western chalukyas the kakatiyas and subsequently uh, vijayanagar uh, rulers the elephant adorned the seal of west ganga rulers and the tiger was the emblem of the cholas and was placed as suzerain over the fish and bow emblem respectively of the pandyas and the uh, cheras so the and the signature is uh, equally important signature forms one of the most important uh, uh, segment of uh, the document or charter though in all uh, charters there are some cited here which are drawn as we know the final stamp of authority was with the affixing of the signature signature was usually done by expressing the name of the king by phrase swahasto mama swahasto mama the classical example of this is the signature of the shri harshavardhana it is best preserved highly florid and most artistically on royal signature there are many instances of king's name with word swahasto mama like boja uh, dhara and uh, in telugu grants also we have ralu meaning signature sometimes the word signature was omitted and merely the name of the king was given in vijayanagar rulers as virupaksha like that only the name uh, and the scribe is uh, equally if i don't mention this it should be uh, incomplete rather the scribe occupied a very prominent position in the document the record they created ornamental letters and often wrote records with greatest care and dexterity by spray it may be noted that though a common man was well educated sought to avoid writing as the scribes handwriting was distinctly superior it is very interesting to note that expert craftsmen undertook the task of inscribing uh, but official documents on the less permanent material like leaf bark and cloth were executed by trained scribes they formed a class by themselves like akas scribes with extraordinary skill were chosen to work on the royal place as raja lekhakas as a express earlier a raja lekhaka is found in nagarjuna konda inscription i mean sculpture representation of show the scribe depicted to show is uh, casting the horoscope and recording the prediction of the astrologer who were summoned by shuddhodana for knowing the future of his new born son siddhartha the scribe is depicted holding the cut leaves of uh, a description i will just uh, skip out so there are a plethora of uh, inscriptions where lipikaras to great pride uh, in their execution uh, one of the sukshma shiva of of gouda country epigrapher of the absurd uh, inscription aditya sena describes his letter as uh, vikataksara he calls his writing you uh, another engraver proudly styled himself as akshara lalita acharya he is called like that who was responsible for engraving a charter of eastern chalukya king narendra mirraj so likewise uh, there are many uh, inscriptions uh, where engravers eulogize their own way of writing in beautiful words and it may not be uh, wrong to say they infused a lot of calligraphical elements please note they infused a lot of uh, calligraphical uh, elements to scripts in which inscriptions and especially mention may be made of uh, some of the inscription uh, written in kutila and siddhamatrika characters and even uh, early nagari inscriptions ranging especially from 6 to 8th century they are super we have uh, when i was holding the office i did conduct an exhibition on calligraphical element 
especially Sanskrit inscription. On one hand, we had Arabic and Persian inscriptions. We too had a number of uh, middle that period inscription, Sanskrit inscription, even in inscription written in other scripts too. We did engage, uh, had a beautiful uh, calligraphical uh, exhibition of uh, the inscriptions. So just uh, I request the uh, to stay connected uh, for a few minutes. I will uh, go with the some slides to explain whatever I told. Uh, maybe another few minutes uh, will take to uh, show this. Uh, please stay connected. Please do. Yeah. Please. Huh? Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. Sir, what do you screen share the right to Nikita Naprega? Yes, sir. Yeah, finally, able to hold. There he is. Sir. Sir, he's he's panelist, sir, uh, so he can share the screen. Sir, you have to unmute first. Okay. Any problem? In one people? minute, just. Uh, I'm taking some help. Just. Sure, sure. sure. Can't see share screen disabled participant screen sharing. We often only based on Uh, 
uh, able to see the screen? Yeah, yes, sir. Visible. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, you are able to see the screen? Yes. yes. Sir. My voice audible? Yes. yes sir. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, this is the uh, copper plate which I explained uh, intact. You know, with the seal and ring. Uh, we'll go to the other thing, and uh, especially in northern India. Uh, there are single plate inscription where the seal itself is soldered on the top of the uh, copper plate uh, that we see there are many such uh, uh, copper plate charters and uh, the calligraphical element which uh, i was mentioning uh, most of them have taken from c sivaramurthy's book and this is from the uh, uh, temple uh, kailasanatha temple where it is so beautifully engraved Sri Kalanka Rahitaha, uh, how artistic and uh, this one. And this is again a Kannada inscription. Sri Purna Varni. See, these are all the calligraphical elements which I mentioned at the end, how beautifully they are uh, engraved, you can see. Uh, so I have, I'm using most of the thing I copies. And this is the most, uh, one of the beautiful uh, calligraphical element, which we see from the Siddhamatrika inscriptions, which uh, like that we have many hundreds. It forms a class by itself as a calligraphy, this one. And uh, this is a seal where uh, on the seal, you can see Sri Vishama Siddhi is written, uh, just a seal uh, with on the full blown, lotus and uh, this is of uh, uh, Bhattaraka, Vumetraka uh, charter where you see the seal Bhattaraka is written again this is another seal where a coach and the bull is depicted on a lotus on either side some insignias are depicted and see again this is the Bhattaraka uh, you see the hole, the seal with the ring attached there, the coach and bull. And this Vaka Takai was explaining, we don't have. And the here you see the uh, Vaka Takalalama, say like that, a seal which you find invariably uh, on all the uh, copper plate charters of the Vaka Takas written in uh, box head characters. Again, this is a seal where Gajalakshmi is depicted on the upper half and this the seal. Uh, I was uh, referring uh, in my talk where it is so shallow, just with a style as you know, he has tried to engrave. It is very, very indistinct, uh, just with a sharp instrument, he has tried to engrave. This is one of the things which I uh, mentioned in my talk very shallow engraving and this uh, regarding the how the king you know how in both you can see the first half how beautifully it is engraved and the second half though belonging to the same king of uh, different uh, this one uh, it is not so you can see the rustic strain he just got it engraved now uh, and not in a way it is required there are many such uh, examples I have shown one among them. And this is the palimpsest, where I told, you know, the, they use the uh, Chalukyan, that's a Chalukyan inscription, uh, and they re-engraved. Again, you find the Nandinagari characters of the Vijayanagar period. They reused the earlier one. It is called the palimpsest, and this is one uh, such uh, example. And the Paramara charters invariably you see here the Garuda holding a snake invariably in all the churches and sometimes it figures in different this one and uh, Sohasto Mama is also written with the name of the king. And this is also another chart where you see the Garuda holding the snake. As this is the one inscription where the first, this is a painted uh, charter, 
copper plate charter, only they have engraved the first line here. If you see here, notice the first line they have engraved, the remaining all painted, they left it just. So this gives a clue how the process was there. First uh, painting, ink they used and the later they uh, engraved upon that. Also coming to the iconographical aspects, again I have taken some, I copied this uh, from the book where Brahma is uh, depicted with the holding uh, manuscripts. And this is a very unique uh, sculpture, Goddess Saraswati, preserved in Mathura Museum. Uh, in fact, she is holding uh, a palm leaf, a set of a palm leaf in her hand. Very rare, I couldn't access the uh, original image, but this is a very uh, unique uh, inscription belonging to the Kushana period. And this is again uh, Vishnu uh, holding leaf uh, is shown here. And then the Buddha image where he is holding the palm leaf and uh, with Abhaya Mudra is seen. And these are the Shaivite the saints uh, holding the palm leaf, the hands, the hand, and the uh, Agastya, or this Muni, where you have this thing. Uh, this is a very uh, rare, of course, again, uh, drawing, uh, where a sculpture is holding from Nagarjuna Konda, and he want to bring it the text, you know, as and when told, he is writing, he is holding the leaf, and also with a pen or something in his hand, he is trying to uh, place it on the record that is uh, depicted here. So these all box edit characters I did not go. And this specifically I want to show here, it just like look like a palm leaf with very few uh, lines and uh, it gives when you, especially the earlier copper plate charters, when you look, they uh, give an appearance of the uh, palm leaf. And these are the thing, again, uh, Garuda, Ah, this Malayalam, uh, one of the late period inscription, just uh, when looking at it, you mistake it for a palm leaf or a copper plate. Just uh, because uh, the, you see the writing portion is uh, very uh, shallow and uh, just uh, they have written with uh, a sharp uh, instrument. So you don't see the depth in that recording. Okay. Okay, well, just a minute, just. So, yeah. Okay, the, with this, uh, I uh, conclude uh, my talk, uh, which I have shown some supportive uh, illustrations also, uh, though I had to hurry through certain aspects because the topic which I chose uh, is very vast and I hope I have done. Uh, Can you close the screens here? Yes, yes, sir. One minute, sir, yes. You stop the screen share. We have to click on that. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Two questions I have if before before the formal uh, formally we'll close the session. Uh, first is that what is the volume of the copper plates in India? And second thing is, what, what is the earliest copper plate in India? Where is that? Yeah. See, the, in terms of the copper plate, the, it's not exactly known because 
still many copper plates are coming up. Uh, there is a huge number. Do not be when we cannot equal the number with the stone inscriptions, but certainly the number of copper plates are also equally enormous. When you especially look into the dynasties like Maitreya, Savalabhi, or Gahadwalas, we have to reconstruct the history, their history, only with the help of their uh, uh, copper plates. So the exact number of copper plates known is not exactly uh, updated. So there are a uh, large number of copper plates has come, even coming now. As per the earliest, uh, the Patika uh, Taxila inscription, uh, that is the earliest known uh, copper plate uh, charter, uh, as I understand. So this is the two things which you would like to say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so where, where, where is this uh, located? This inscription. Taxila. Taxila, oh, where it is preserved, I don't know. It present yeah. maybe in some museum, but hmm. originally it is from Taxila. Okay. Yes. Thank you. I am fortunate to have the honor of proposing a formal vote of thanks on behalf of National Mission for Manuscripts, IGNC for the Tattavada lecture so ably delivered by Dr. T. S. Ravishankar. Dr. Ravishankar's lecture this evening covered a wide range of important practical aspects of documents, <coughs> seals, inscriptions, signature, and scribes in Indian epigraphs and, <coughs> and would have been highly appreciated by participate, participants attending. Thank you, Dr. Ravi Shankar, for taking the time off and addressing us. We thoroughly enjoyed this very informative lecture and the visual display of old seals, ornamental writings, and iconography. I also thank Dr. Shachidananda Joshi, Member Secretary IGNC, and Professor Pratapananda Jha, Director of National Mission for Manuscripts, for taking so much interest in these lectures and ensuring they are of very high standard. I also would like to thank the participants whose interest in the subjects like today's provide us the inspiration to continue with these wonderful lectures. Thank you. Thank you, sir.